elected Prime Minister Shabazz Sharif promises to turn Pakistan around as the country faces daunting economic and security challenges. Hello, I'm Elaine Reyes sitting in for Anand Naidu, and this is The Heat. Shabazz Sharif, the challenges are not new. This is his second term as prime minister. Sharif has pledged to heal Pakistan's political divisions, launch an economic revitalization plan, and improve ties with its neighbors. Inflation is reportedly hovering at 30 percent, while close to 40 percent of the people live below the poverty line. This, as the country continues to grapple with substantial debt, 125 billion in external debt, and liabilities alone. CGTN's Daniel Khan has more on the new government's strategy to turn things around. Asif Ali Zardari is sworn in this week as Pakistan's president has taken immediate steps to tackle the country's economic crisis, including a move to refuse his salary. Analysts suggest Zardari wants to set a precedent for responsible financial management amid the country's mounting debt and escalating commodity prices. Pakistan urgently seeks a new loan from the International Monetary Fund. Meanwhile, Prime Minister Shahbaz Sharif has said the first challenge for his government is taming inflation and stabilizing food prices. In a move to control prices, the government has approved a ban on onion and banana exports until mid-April to safeguard the availability of essential commodities at home. Urging swift action, Sharif has emphasized the need for what he calls a deep surgery to rescue Pakistan from economic crisis, directing the immediate formation of a committee to regulate food prices, including strict measures against unjustified price increases and profiteering. Sharif says his government will have to make difficult decisions without wasting any time to stabilize Pakistan. Daniel Khan, CGTN, Islamabad. So there is a lot to talk about. Let's get right to our panel. Syed Ali Zafar serves in Pakistan's Senate as a member of Imran Khan's PTI party. Soon Ahmed Khan is a research fellow at the Center for China and Globalization. Also joining us is Mosharraf Zaidi. He's the founder and CEO of Tabadlab, a Pakistan public policy firm. And Kamar Bashir served as the press secretary to former Pakistani President Arif Alvi. Thank you all for joining us. We appreciate your time. Um, Kamar, let's start with you. Prime Minister Sharif's new government faces daunting challenges, as we have heard, including an unprecedented economic crisis, regular power cuts, nearly daily political violence, and a challenging relationship with its neighbor, Afghanistan. So there is a lot on his plate, as we know. What should be his initial priorities? Uh, thank you so much. Uh, in, actually, uh, I think uh, Mr. Shabazz Sharif, uh, as far as election 2024 is concerned, was the best choice uh, to be the prime minister because he is a reconciliator, moderator, and he can build alliances very easily, especially in this uh, event when Pakistan economy is facing daunting challenges, as you rightly said. In his address uh, the, uh, to the newly sworn in uh, cabinet yesterday, which you also referred, he outlined not only the problems, but the solutions also. Kamar, inflation is reportedly hovering, hovering at 30 percent, while close to 40 percent of the people live below the poverty line, as we mentioned. Here is what one resident had to say about the new government. The election of the new prime minister will not make a difference. The condition of the people is deteriorating day by day, and their problems will not be solved by this. This is the continuity of the same status quo which has prevailed in the country from the beginning, and it seems that it will continue to prevail. People are worried about inflation and high prices. Kamar, how will Prime Minister Sharif succeed where others have failed? Actually, uh, the, uh, Mr. Shabaz Sharif also outlined the solutions also. He said that the first thing about Pakistan economy is how to create the liquidity within the Pakistan economy. So that was how to collect the due taxes from the people, which were otherwise not being collected. He was very clear when he said that there will be a surgical operation in the uh, FBR, that is Federal Revenue Board of Pakistan, 
where uh, he said that 3,000 billion has been siphoned off from the uh, government exchequer. So he wanted to bring in a lot of reforms into the FDR so that 3,000 billion, which has been uh, siphoned off, they are, in, uh, they are included in the Pakistan economy which will provide a lot of liquidity which is needed. Syed, I want to bring him in for just a minute. Parliament's election of Shabazz Sharif, uh, you know, he this is his second term in office, um, but there was a lot of political turmoil leading up to that. And this new government, as we know, faces a lot of economic turmoil. Um, the, the February vote, however, was marred by allegations of large-scale rigging and delayed results. So what will he need to do to win broader support and bring everyone together? The first thing is that um, I think Pakistan is a country where people have shown they believe in democracy, but unfortunately uh, their mandate has not been respected. And so this government is perceived to be very weak, it's perceived to be a government that's not legitimate, and the people are not behind it. Now, of course, uh, Shabazz Sharif is right when he says that very difficult and hard decisions have to be taken. There is not just the economic crisis, there are also security issues, there are law and order issues, justice reform needs to be done, health, education are two elements, two, two considerations that need urgent attention. Population growth is something that needs to be uh, tackled. All these are issues that require hard decisions. There are solutions, of course, but hard decisions have to be taken. And for that, you need people behind the government. And if people are not behind the government, they will not accept those hard decisions. They will take those decisions as something that's oppressive. And therefore, no government can survive uh, with this kind of a mandate, where people are not behind those hard decisions. And therefore, I feel that uh, we perhaps, because of what has happened in the previous elections, we perhaps need fresh elections again. Uh, and this time, uh, we need to make sure that there are no allegations of rigging and nothing uh, takes place which, is, which, which actually erodes the legitimacy of democracy. We know that uh, the new cabinet was sworn in. I want to turn to Mosharraf. You recently wrote in Geo News that, quote, it is hard to remember when there was uh, less excitement about a new Pakistani government. And then you also added the problem that hounded the first term of Prime Minister Sharif in 2022-23 and that will haunt him even more in 2024 is the absence of a coherent objective. So elaborate on that for us if you can. Sure, Elaine. Elaine, thanks very much. I think, you know, the problem that Pakistani elites have now got themselves into is a fundamental belief that their job is to help the country and the economy survive. Their job is to keep democracy on the ventilator and not let it die. Their job is to make sure that people get enough government handouts so that they don't starve to death. Their job is to make sure that a minimum deterrence to the aggression and territorial uh, brutality that India engages in and that Iran and Afghanistan have tried to engage in with Pakistan, that there's only a minimum deterrence. So the common theme that you see in the posture of Pakistani elites, the military, the civilian bureaucracy, whether it's Nawaz Sharif's party or it's Imran Khan's party or it's Asif Ali Zardari's party, there's a coherent and consistent belief that this country can barely survive. And so when you have that belief, it's very difficult to imagine any kind of radical transformation. What you can imagine is exactly what Shabazz Sharif is, is going to try to deliver. He's going to try and secure an IMF program. Now, in a world where some countries are sp sending spaceships to Mars, and to the moon. Some countries are thinking about the next steps in AI and how they're going to enable their citizens to live better lives. Think, countries are thinking of how to go beyond 100% literacy to greater cognitive skills and the interaction between machines and human beings. 
Here's Pakistan, a country of 250 million people, and its leaders are thinking, how can we get the next IMF loan? How can we get the next extension of a loan from China or from Saudi Arabia? And so when you have this kind of a mindset in a country's elite, then, of course, young people. The country is more than half the country is below the age of 23. So, of course, young people are going to be upset. Of course, there's going to be a legitimacy problem. And, of course, there's going to be a lack of excitement. Well, I want to come back to that uh, in just a few moments. But I do want to bring in Kamar to get his take on what he just heard. Kamar, what do you make of this? Actually, uh, uh, saying, of course, we know that the country is facing a lot of difficulties. Uh, there's no doubt about it, as uh, Sayyid Musharraf has just said. But at the same time, there is optimism also. As the Prime Minister very rightly said, that we need to do a lot of hard work. We need to set our direction right. We have to build consensus among the political parties and political leaders for charting the way out for to come out of this uh, quagmire, which is we are facing right now. Of course, there are security challenges. Of course, there is economic challenges. But by bringing in reforms, radical reforms, which this government is going to do, like uh, privatization of the PIA, which is happening of about 800 billion out of Pakistan's kitty, then this government is going to take uh, the electricity theft, which happens of about 500 billion every year out of the government's pocket. And then it is going to privatize the uh, state-owned organization, which is happening of around 800 billion per year. And also the circular debt, which is about 4,000 billion. So after doing all this, you will have, actually you can imagine this kind of a money which is being uh, doled out in the form of subsidies. If they are bring back into the national economy, you will have a lot of uh, uh, liquidity and you will be able to handle a lot of other issues like debt issues and also bringing down the inflation and giving subsidy to the poor people. So it is not everything is lost as uh, we normally believe. But we have seen nations which are which have been facing such situation in the past, uh, but they came out of this quagmire, like China itself. We know the example. A lot of people who are below the poverty lines, and now almost there is no poverty in China. So we can learn from the examples and come out of these issues by facing commitment, political consensus building, and also moving together, as the Prime Minister has been offering to all the political partners that we should sit together, set the direction right, and move forward with the elected speed. We want to turn to China. China has invested almost $30 billion, mostly in energy and infrastructure projects, part of the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor, with the aim of enhancing connectivity and trade between the countries. Former Pakistani Senator Mushahid Hussein recently talked about the impact of CPEC on the country's economy. One of the flagships of the BRI is the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor, CPEC, of which I was chairman as parliamentary leader uh, in the past when it began 10 years ago. $26 billion of Chinese investment has taken place on CPEC projects in Pakistan in the last 10 years. 250,000 Pakistanis have gotten jobs. 8,000 megawatts of electricity generated, 600 kilometers of roads and highways have been built, and it has led to employment for youth, education. 28,000 Pakistani students have been studying in China. And in large parts of Pakistan, it has helped in transforming people's lives, especially women. Soon, by the end of last year, 36 projects under the CPEC framework with a cumulative value of $24 billion had been completed with the construction of 22 ongoing projects valued at $5 billion. And that is according to Pakistan Today. So my question for you is, how would you characterize China-Pakistan ties, and where do you see it going under Prime Minister Sharif? So, Elaine, thank you so much for having me on the program. I think, I mean, the fact that we are having this conversation right uh, after the two sessions have been held in China uh, is something very important. Because uh, this is a meeting that China holds every year to understand what projects, what investments, what policies are working and how to further refine the domestic development and the execution of these developments. How does this connect with CPEC? 
Of course, as Senator Mushai Hussain mentioned in that clip you shared, we have have seen massive developments, especially because when we talk about major infrastructure projects, we talk about energy uh, infrastructure, we talk about transportation. We have seen multiple projects also when it comes to education. We're not only talking about tens of thousands of youth of Pakistan studying in the leading universities of China, but also technical and vocational education. We are talking about capacity building. Now, this is phase one, and this is a phase in which Pakistan has definitely showcased a lot of successes. We do see 250,000 people being employed and women being incorporated in employment that uh, that was in unfathomable in parts of Pakistan. That said, I think the reason I mentioned the two sessions is also because now we need to think about the step forward. And the step forward is phase two. This is going to be about not only having a consensus amongst all parties of Pakistan that we will collaborate with China, uh, China was a priority partner for uh, Prime Minister Sharif, for also the previous prime ministers. It has been a priority country for every government in Pakistan to engage with. But the real question is, we have consensus, but how well are we able to execute our decisions? How well do we uh, agree on a long-term economic policy? So yes, the collaboration with China is a priority. This is, uh, as we say in Pakistan, I mean, we think of Pakistan's development and when we think of it, we envision Pakistan, uh, China to be a core partner in that. But how will we learn from China's journey, learn from China's system of like implementing economic decisions, having a long term plan to be able to attract foreign investment? How will we be able to use these phase one investments in infrastructure, education, etc., to actually uh, be able to attract and to be uh, to build the capacity? of our people to be able to serve as an economic hub. So I think these are important conversations to have. And of course, you know, political stability, having a consensus between all political parties that we need to be able to think of five, 10 year visions that will uh, that will boost investor confidence. Uh, Pakistan is of course, you know, a country that is dealing with a lot of economic challenges. And here I'll also refer to a few points made earlier that you know, we as Pakistan, even though we are 250 million people, we have one of the youngest populations in the world, we cannot compare ourselves with another country of the same size. But what we can do is think of examples of countries that have recently developed. Think of the core challenges that we are facing and think of CPEC, the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor, as an opportunity. What are other countries that are collaborating with China under the Belt and Road Initiative who have now uh, now showcase themselves as attractive investment destinations where uh, millions of people are being employed, are manufacturing, are uh, contributing to the export. What are those countries doing? What are local, uh, you know, some local developments in China are very relevant to Pakistan's current experience. So I think when it comes to, again, China-Pakistan collaboration, cooperation, we need to think about the specific lessons that we can learn from the Chinese experience. We need to think about how other countries are cooperating with China. What are the success stories? What can we replicate from that? What can we learn from that? And most importantly, we need to think about the political stability of our country as a priority. Without political stability, without long-term planning, without consensus on economic issues of how to engage the youth, we cannot see a Pakistan moving forward. And we don't just need to walk the talk. We need to brisk walk. We really need to prioritize as all parties take ownership of where Pakistan is headed. We want to turn to neighboring Afghanistan. And this is for Saeed. You know, Pakistan is dealing with a resurgence of extremist groups along its border with Afghanistan. So Saeed, uh, with relations with India, will that remain vulnerable to crises and pose a threat to regional and international security? And also, do you think um, Prime Minister Sharif will push for a reset with India. So I want to get your thoughts on both Afghanistan and India. Uh, Elaine, I think the main uh, issue is that there is consensus on, I think, between all political players in the country uh, on our foreign policies. Uh, for example, uh, we discussed China just now, and I fully endorse and agree uh, that the potential of CPAC and our relationship with China uh, the potential of CPAC, of course, is uh, is unparalleled, and the relationship with China goes back decades, uh, ever since the birth of the country. We've been together, so it's uh, there, there's complete consensus there. Now, in terms of Afghanistan, of course, again there's consensus that we need to. Uh, it, Afghanistan is a very important neighbor. We've got a lot of uh, cultural, economic ties. There's a lot of trade that goes on. There's a vast border. 
and we always have believed that we need a very strong relationship uh, of mutual respect and understanding with Afghanistan. Uh, unfortunately, there have been instances in the past where relationships have soured, uh, mostly because of uh, external influences um, um, from bordering India and other places in Afghanistan against Pakistan, and that has created rifts in the past. But we've weathered the storm. And uh, so there's consensus there, there's political consensus on how to deal with Afghanistan. Given a few uh, nuances and a few uh, you know, variations, but the general consensus is there. With India, again, we realize that both countries can progress uh, and benefit greatly from mutual trade. There are many things that Pakistani industries make. There's many agricultural goods that Pakistani produces, which are far, Pakistan produces, which are far cheaper. And uh, so does India, and there could be mutual exchange. Uh, the problem has been always uh, Kashmir. And uh, that a few decades ago, we almost resolved those issues, but uh, unfortunately uh, didn't work through, didn't, didn't, didn't go through. And so we have that one outstanding matter. Until that is resolved, uh, unfortunately, the two countries try as they may uh, with the people in people contact, and the people actually have very good relationships with each other. But at that certain critical level uh, and beyond, it doesn't, it, we just can't work together until the crisis of Kashmir is solved. So we uh, see as that as a problem, and, a, and a, uh, there is a solution, uh, but the solution needs a consensus from both sides. Uh, so we, we see that as an ongoing problem constantly. With Iran, of course, You've not mentioned Iran, but we have, again, a very friendly relationship with them, and we believe that uh, we should build on that. There's a lot of cultural ties. The language is almost uh, taken, our language, which is Urdu, is almost, um, a lot of it is, in, uh, is, is borrowed from or taken from Persian language. So we've got similarities uh, of culture also and um, uh, religion and all that. And so we need to be build up our, our friendships more. There has been a slight skirmish, but I'm glad that diplomatically we've settled that fairly quickly. So we've got, uh, uh, we, I think the general consensus is that we need to develop better relationships with all our uh, neighbors. Mo Sharif, these, uh, this question is for you. We know that a bailout from the International Monetary Fund has kept the economy of Pakistan afloat. But that program will expire later this month. And there are reports that Pakistan will seek a new three-year arrangement worth $6 billion. Where does that stand? And what kind of impact will that have on the country's heavy debt? It'll have almost no impact at all. It's the kind of support that one is embarrassed to call support. Uh, I think it's important to remember it's not the IMF that has kept Pakistan afloat. It's the China. Saudi Arabia and United Arab Emirates uh, loan facilities, if you will, that keep getting turned over and rolled over that have kept uh, the economy from defaulting. A six billion program over three years is uh, is literally it's 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 laughable in terms of the quantum of support that is needed for Pakistan to truly be stabilized. I haven't heard that number, Elaine, but if that number is true, then that is the first very significant failure of the new government. But my hope is that the new finance minister, who is a thorough professional and very, very capable, will be keenly aware of the quantum of Pakistan's debt problem. The total debt, internal and external, that Pakistan carries is $272 billion. It's almost three quarters of the size of the economy itself. And for most countries, this is not a debt burden that is unsustainable. But for Pakistan, which struggles to export, which struggles to drive remittances higher than they already are, uh, it's a very substantial burden. And so I think the real question isn't so much whether there'll be an IMF pro program or not. The real question is the size. Anything less than a $15 billion program over five years, I will I will adjudge to have been a big failure, both by the IMF and by the government, uh, for negotiating something that keeps us as a country on life support instead of giving us the very critical 
uh, boost that the country will need in order to get back into the growth scenario. We've been talking about China's uh, support of Pakistan, and Zoom, this is for you. Pakistan was among the first countries we know to join uh, China's Belt and Road Initiative. And late last year, the largest ever joint exercise between the Chinese and Pakistani navies were held to jointly safeguard strategic sea lanes and regional peace and stability. Um, how do you see their strategic partnership? Uh, again, thank you, Elaine. I mean, uh, one of the terms used for Pakistan is, of course, all weather strategic cooperative partner. Uh, strategically, in terms of our priorities in the region and beyond, Pakistan and China have for decades, historically, we've been on the same page. We would like a region that has more pragmatic synergy and a region where we can work on economic cooperation pragmatically. This exercise is one example. Pakistan is an importer of Chinese military equipment as well. Uh, we have worked on multiple trainings, collaborative uh, on collaborative platforms. Pakistan is also an important member of the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. That envisions mm -hmm. regional st stability and synergy. And another very important example where China is playing a role in imparting that spirit in the region is last May when we had the trilateral between Iran, Pakistan, and China. That was an excellent example to build confidence between the two neighbors. And that also helped, you know, with deeper... A diplomatic consensus with the Afghan Taliban government. So I think, I mean, this is a core of the relationship. It's an important part of Pakistan's also strategic vision to deepen this relationship. But most importantly, at the heart of this strategic element, this strategic dimension, is a region that can work together towards better economic collaboration. All right, Zoon, thank you so much for that. Saeed, Kamar, Mosharraf, we appreciate your time. Thank you for joining us on The Heat. And that is it for this edition of The Heat. I'm Elaine Reyes in Washington, D.C. Thanks so much for joining us.